Between 20,000 and 40,000 years ago, humans in Europe entered into a dark and foreboding gloom, lit their animal fat-fueled lamps, and proceeded to produce artistic masterpieces that, when rediscovered millennia later, led Pablo Picasso to declare modern art had invented nothing. The subterranean gloom encountered by these early artists was nothing substantially different from their everyday existence on the surface above. Outside these caves, in the open air of a world existing under a chaotic void-like sky, mankind's early ancestors are reported in myth to have lived in a perpetual twilight, devoid of our current sun. Their world, according to many ancient creation accounts, was permeated by a dull glow that provided barely enough light in which to read your average Paleolithic newspaper. Duardu Cardona, in a chapter in his book Godstar, titled The Age of Darkness, points to comments made by P. Wheeler on the Japanese creation myth that indicate the universal nature of the Kronos Saturn myth as the main construct in this primordial age of darkness. In the earliest legend with which the recital opens, one recognizes the primal myth, the development from a primordial darkness of chaos. This is the Kronos legend in its thousand forms, the father of all mythologies, upon which so many peoples have constructed their cosmogonies. While also providing many direct quotes from various world creation myths, including Jewish literature, Cordona cites H. Osborne, whose work on South American mythology also recognized this primeval age of darkness theme. Some mythological cycles feature a primitive age of darkness before the existence of the sun, when human beings lived in a state of anarchy without the techniques of civilized life. An age before the existence of the sun, as noted by Cordona, which descriptions may leave the reader with the mistaken impression that without the sun there was no light at all. Yet this is not quite the case in mythology, and the same creation myths point to the existence of at least a modest amount of light before the coming of the sun, albeit from a different source to our sun. That source was Saturn, the ancient creator god in his myriad of forms throughout world mythology and conclusively identified with the planet Saturn. This celestial Saturn was the very same small and weak raven character in the Eskimo creation myth. The light of our current sun, as a rule, is not essential to life. Microbial life can exist in a sunless environment, as can species of deep sea life. While photosynthesis in vegetation works best in the darker red light spectrum, rather than the harsh and bright ultraviolet light of the sun. So it is not inconceivable that life on Earth, as we know it, could have existed and even flourished in a predominantly nocturnal world, provided there was some form of radiated red spectrum light or energy. Most species of animal, including those now long extinct, exhibit high degrees of nocturnal adaptation of all the higher creatures currently inhabiting the Earth. Human beings are probably the least adapted to a nocturnal environment. Yet traditional mythologies remember a time of darkness stretching out into an unknown antiquity, a time in which the god Saturn in all his manifestations was small and weak, a mere shadow 
of the creative force he was destined to become. As mankind's first remembered source of light, long before the coming of the sun, Saturn is said to have cast its pale light on a world without seasons and devoid of any means for humans to calculate time. Locked in a stationary post that is reported in mythology to have been at the northern celestial realms, the primordial Saturn seemingly drifted aimlessly through the skies on a chaotic heavenly milieu resembling the ebb and flow of a dark ocean. In this state of affairs that is referred to in the opening verses of Genesis, when darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Our conclusion here is that Saturn is primordial source of a dim, timeless light was a duly glowing sub-brown dwarf star, of which Earth was one of its primary and original satellites, and the Earth was nestled close enough to its original host star to have been enveloped in Saturn's opaque and warming plasma sheath. For humans alive on Earth at this time, there would have been no reference to the greater cosmos and therefore no reference to any moving celestial object with which they could have marked the passage of time. This was a timeless age in which the dim blue-red light spectrum emanating from Saturn would have cast a dark purple-hued glow over the Earth's surface. This, then, was mankind's purple dawn of creation. Electric Universe physicist Wallace Thornhill has suggested the planets orbiting closely to brown dwarf stars would be the best place to go looking for life as we know it outside the solar system. This is a possibility under the EU model because all types of stars, including brown dwarfs, are explained as an electric discharge phenomenon taking place where vast cosmic and electrically live Birkeland currents entwine and pinch down into what is called a Z-pinch, also known as a Bennett pinch. Discovered over 100 years ago, Birkeland currents, or the filamentary gas strings of twisting plasma ropes seen in space, are viewed in the EU model as the galaxy's power lines, feeding electrical power to all of the stars we see in the shining night sky. The eyes of that extinct species of giant whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as our eyes do now. Abraham Lincoln, 1848. He who knows nothing is closer to the truth than he whose mind is filled with falsehoods and errors. Thomas Jefferson. And for even Abraham Lincoln to mention to Congress that there were giants once on the earth, it all makes total sense. Plants grow better in red light. You know, they have fossils of 100 foot tall mushroom in Alaska. You know, this whole red thing with people, like the red ochre people, purple being a royal color. It lends serious gravity to Saturn theory. That the Earth was once a planet of a brown dwarf star system. And how they know that it's a difference from a brown or a red dwarf, I take that as the brown dwarf is just a lot smaller and cooler perhaps more stable. He never mentioned anything that I've heard of where uh, life can exist around a red dwarf. They're much more violent. That's the bad thing about living in uh, an environment like that. 
it can affect you and there would be many not many but more than a few extinction events every so often i mean for all we know it could happen here too at one particular time or perhaps several an ocean's worth of water was dumped on the earth salt soil rock heavy metals you name it got sent to earth from saturn when it flared or nova the earth was bathed in the light of a brown star, Saturn. Earth would have been much smaller as well. For example, a little known fact exists that dinosaurs, even giants, could not lift themselves off the ground or live comfortably in Earth's gravity today. Then it had to be smaller. If it was one-third of what it is today, when it was a satellite of Saturn, we just nobody ever talks about that the dinosaurs and their weight issue with today's gravity they don't even mention it i'm going to show you some clips from david talbot's remembering the end of the world he says that myth is our key to remembering the whole universal monarch thing heaven in the sky it's very very interesting and just trying to show you a clip of the show is leaving out really valuable information, so um, please, by all means, watch Remembering the End of the World if you haven't already. It's excellent graphics. Blood poured from the mountains which split and came crashing down. and the earth was engulfed in great clouds of darkness. But the dragon is a biologically impossible monster. So what did the ancient chronicles mean by a dragon moving among the stars and disturbing the planets? The Aztecs and Maya, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Chinese, Japanese, and Oceanic races, early British, Celtic, and Germanic nations, the Greeks and Romans, all employed the cosmic serpent or dragon as a hieroglyph for one celestial phenomenon, a comet. In ancient astronomies, the dragon and the comet carry the same meaning. They mean the end of the world, cosmic night, doomsday. Velikovsky had noticed that the most common symbol of sweeping catastrophe was the serpent or dragon attacking the world. I discovered that from one culture to another, many different hieroglyphs for the comet are attached to the serpent or dragon. Bearded dragons. Fiery dragons. Serpents with long flowing hair. Feathered serpents. This led me to a guiding principle when different symbols all point to the same thing, you are on the edge of discovery. But if the dragon meant the comet, and the comet meant doomsday, what about the other characters in our fairy tale? What about the hero? What about the beautiful princess? In the myth of St. George, the dragon of darkness attacks the village and carries off the beautiful princess.
Then along comes the hero, St. George, who vanquishes the dragon and frees the princess. But in the earlier versions of this story, the dragon is the terrible aspect of the princess herself. So the hero is actually saving the princess from her own alter ego. In the later versions, the innocent princesses and fair maidens are often victimized by an ugly witch. And yet the witch, the devouring hag, and the ogress, like the dragon, all represent the alter ego, or terrible aspect, of the princess herself. And while the witch may soar across the sky with disheveled or flaming hair, she also takes the form of a serpent or fire-breathing dragon when she grows wrathful. It was said of the witch's hair that it could bring rain, hail, wind, and lightning, exactly what ancient nations said of the comet. So too the witch's broom. From Europe to Asia, the clump of grass or straw or feathers, the primitive broom or whisk, was an acknowledged symbol of the comet. In the Americas, Aztec history remembered Venus as the great feathered serpent. And they called Venus the smoking star, the very phrase they used for a comet. The stargazers of Peru knew Venus as Chasca, the long-haired star, the most common phrase for the comet among ancient peoples. Venus, daughter and spouse of the universal monarch. Within the womb of the goddess resided the unborn hero, Mars, heart of the heart, pupil of the eye. The goddess was the great star, radiating its comet-like hair in all directions, the celestial prototype of the beautiful princess. She was the glory of heaven, the animating flame giving life to the ancient sun god. Her place was squarely in the center of the sun. This produced the great wheel of the sun, with the goddess as the nave and the hero as the axle. As the configuration evolved, the comet-like streams gathered into three rays, remembered as the triform or threefold goddess. Later, the same comet-like material presented four streamers or rays, giving the wheel its four spokes, 
four luminous winds, four life-bearing streams, four flaming arrows launched into the four directions, and the four pillars of heaven. great crescent on Saturn, this crescent enclosing the central star of Venus. Saturn's crescent horns provided the celestial timepiece for the daily cycle, fading against a brightening sky as they rose to the right. Growing brilliant as they descended to the left. goddess engaged in a spiraling dance about the cosmic center. The serpent tail wrapped itself around Venus to produce a band presenting the form of a great eye, so that in its re-entry Mars became the pupil or the red apple of the eye. Saturn's golden age was interrupted by catastrophe when the enclosure of the gods was sealed shut. The descent of the hero in his dark aspect brought overwhelming clouds and darkness. was the underworld journey, the archetypal ordeal of the hero, and for the earth, a deluge of fire and water. rose out of the waters of the deep to produce the world mountain. formed the rim of the great world wheel, 
the fiery body of the encircling serpent. Watered by the four rivers, this was the land of the gods, resting on the summit of the world mountain, a bright crescent forming the horned peak. The mountain of Mars became the mooring post of the turning sky. The column of wind or water rising along the world axis. The pillar of the cosmos with its four extensions holding aloft the world wheel. But the ancient paradise did not last. The hero spirited away the goddess or stole the heart of the universal monarch who tumbled from the summit of heaven. The Golden Age gave way to the cosmic night, when the hordes of chaos were set loose and the doomsday dragon moved about in the sky, a monster created by the twisting forms of Venus and Mars. It was then that the terrible goddess appeared with wildly disheveled hair, lamenting the death of the universal monarch. In the events that follow, the hero will subdue the dragon or pacify the raging goddess. The Universal Monarch's own son, Jupiter, will be installed in the center of the sky. But the Universal Monarch has departed, and with his death comes the end of the Golden Age. All that remain are fragments of a collective memory, and hidden deep in the human psyche, a sense of something irrevocably lost, and yet eternally yearned for a paradise when heaven and earth were one. The death of this paradise was the birth of myth. For several decades now, our probes have explored the heavens, returning messages that challenge our long-held assumptions. Where we expected answers, we found mysterious contradictions. But our expectations were based on an intellectual fiction, the idea of the uneventful solar system. Can we allow for the possibility that our ancestors experienced extraordinary cosmic events, events we've simply forgotten? If we allow this idea, even as a possibility, we are inviting a revolution. One discovery will lead inexorably to another and our entire perspective on the past and the future will be forever changed.
Egypt and the rest of these uh, things that he showed us, all from mythology, all from thousands of years ago. These things clearly were seen by civilizations that never talked to each other from the far corners of the earth. It all just clicked together like a, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle in my mind. A breakthrough for me came when I realized that many different cultures spread around the world use different words, different symbols, different myths to describe precisely the same formations in the sky. The Ouroboros, our celestial serpent biting its tail, for example, occurs on every habitable continent, but it has no ties to the world we now observe. Like all of the archetypes, it is part of an alien sky. A cosmic column rising to the center of the sky, holding aloft the wheel of heaven. And much more than a wheel, because this was the revolving cosmic temple, the city of the gods, the kingdom of heaven, always resting on the cosmic column. Then there's the image of the four rivers or pathways radiating from the center of the sky out to the boundary, the rim of the wheel. The simplest forms lead you invariably to the full story of world mythology. The hero's journey unfolds as the story of the wheel's axle. The mother goddess finds her identity in the star at the summit. The story of the Royal Society, they were created apparently on 28th November 1660, followed a lecture at Jessam College by Christopher Wren, joined by other leading polymaths including Robert Boyle and John Wilkins. The group soon received royal approval. It would be known as the Royal Society of London for improving natural knowledge. The Royal Society's motto Nullus in verba is taken to mean, take nobody's word for it, expression of the determination of fellows to withstand the domination of authority and to verify all statements by an appeal to facts determined by experiment. They violate their own motto. They ignore facts and even hide them or cover them up. The real story of the Royal Society was that they were created by the same people who created the Masons and the Rosicrucians, Francis Bacon and Sir John Dee, to control information because they know that knowledge is power. They paid Darwin to come up with his theory and then claim that Evolution is not a theory, it's a proven scientific fact. Well, I guess that depends on what you want to believe. The belief has no place in science. Once you have a belief, you have to defend it. But I bet you they're a lot closer to the truth than the Royal Society is. It is the same thing in every single science, even events in history. We never get the straight story. The thing about a story is, with scientific reports, and it's the same with news reports, usually the first unfiltered stories you get at an event's happening is closer to the truth than after damage control can come in. But you would think recreating the sun in the laboratory would be like huge news. It should be science changing that they can recreate. But it goes completely unnoticed and gets ignored.
garb. His sword and battle axe are resting next to him. The length of the skeleton is four and a half yards, and the teeth of the big man are measured at six and a half inches long and two broad. End quote. Adding to the evidence verifying the existence of giants are numerous gigantic fossilized footprints. For example, an imprint of a human foot 80 centimeters or two and a half feet in length has been unearthed in Tanzania. Similar footprints of a slightly smaller size, about 50 centimeters or one and a half feet, were found in the Nevada desert, left approximately 250 million years ago. A series of handprints was found next to traces of dinosaurs near a village in Turkmenistan. The height of the giant that left them is estimated at about five meters, almost 16 and a half feet, and lived 150 million years ago. A human tooth five times larger than an ordinary man's tooth was found in Hong Kong in 1935. A 60 centimeter or two foot high human skull with two rows of teeth was found in Alaska in 1950. And a 50 foot long petrified human skeleton, that's 15 meters folks, was found in Mongolia in 1999. The sheer plethora of evidence allows us to state unequivocally that giants did indeed once exist. But whether they were a single people who settled all over the earth or belonged to different races, this is a question which scientists have yet to unambiguously answer. But if giants really existed, and not only in myth and legend, then it stands to reason that other traces of their lives should also exist. For example, architectural structures and other such objects. In the opinion of a number of scientists, the numerous megalithic objects that have been discovered all over the Earth serve as proof of the prior existence of giants. Even in our time, with modern technology, it is extremely difficult to build such monumental objects, and tens or even hundreds of thousands of years ago, without some kind of mechanical lifting mechanisms, it seems that it would have been virtually impossible. And yet, they exist. This is the famous Baalbek Terrace located in Lebanon near Beirut. Three huge stone slabs, each weighing about 800 tons, are embedded in its base. The plates are identical and fit together so seamlessly that one cannot even insert the blade of a knife between them. Researchers calculated that to install just one such stone block, 21 meters wide and 54 meters long, would require the simultaneous effort of at least 35,000 people. Who, how, and why did they do it? Handwritten Arabic treatises say that the structure was built as a temple of Jupiter and that the giant beings built it on the orders of King Nimrod just after the flood. The ancient city of Teotihuacan, the city of gods, is located 31 miles from Mexico City and is an entire complex of huge stone blocks. According to the most common historical version of events, the city was built by giants to turn people into gods. Its layout resembles a model of the solar system. From the central temple, which embodies the sun, at appropriate distances are the planet temples, even including Pluto, which modern astronomers only discovered in 1930. This means that the inhabitants of this site somehow already knew a great deal of astronomy, even at that ancient time. Regarding objects that giants might have built, scholars also include the Egyptian Sphinx, the English Stonehenge, the stone figures of Easter Island, and the Tibetan City of the Gods. Not only are these structures themselves amazing, but also their geometrical connection with each other. For example, a line drawn from the Tibetan City of Gods to the Egyptian Sphinx, if continued, leads directly to Easter Island. And another line from the City of Gods through the Mexican Pyramids also goes to Easter Island. These two lines delineate one-fourth of the Earth's surface, and a line drawn from the City of the Gods to Stonehenge divides this quarter exactly in half. And what about modern people who are giants? One view is that the life and then disappearance of these giants is related to some cosmic cataclysm. There is evidence that, hundreds of millions of years ago, a huge asteroid approached our planet, and the dimensions of this asteroid exceeded those of our present-day moon. It's postulated that it became a satellite of the Earth, and because of this, the gravity in our planet was significantly weakened. It was then that the giants appeared and developed a fairly advanced civilization. Hundreds of thousands or even millions of years later, this satellite descended from its orbit and disintegrated, its debris falling to the Earth. 
Survivors of the disaster, through mutation and adaptation, decreased in size as the gravity on the planet had suddenly increased dramatically. In addition, the ozone layer of the atmosphere decreased sevenfold, increasing the negative impact of solar radiation. Now, a smaller body meant less total surface area and thus a lesser exposure to the sun's radiative effects. Some researchers have ascertained that before the catastrophe, the Earth's atmosphere contained one and a half times as much oxygen as now. Large animals thrive with more oxygen, and this helps explain the fossil record of all the giant animals and plants characteristic of that time, which obviously would also be beneficial to giant humanoids. After the disaster, the size of the giants gradually decreased. According to some well-known anthropologists, such as Christopher Bohm and Franz Weidenreich, before the explosion and fall of the satellite asteroid, the Asuras, inhabitants of the legendary continent of Lemuria, reached a height of 50 meters or 160 feet. As a result of the catastrophe, the continent divided, and the once united race of giants were now isolated from each other. The successors of the Asuras were 18 meters tall, that's about 60 feet, and their successors 6 meters or about 20 feet tall. As a result of these new environmental conditions in the world, the giants in many areas died out. But in some areas they managed to survive, at least until the 16th century. Of course, such a theory runs counter to the teachings of Darwin, but it is this theory that most plausibly explains the existence of the giants. What do you think? Let's discuss this fascinating topic in the comments under the video. Thank you. So the ancient comet theories is going to run into the work of Emanuel Velikovsky, the controversial theorist who suggested that, well, there's a reason for the fears of comets around the world. We experienced this horrific cometary catastrophe. The world was devastated by a comet just a few thousand years ago. And Velikovsky went further. He said that not that long ago, planets appeared in the sky with comet-like attributes. In particular, he named the planet Venus as the great comet of antiquity. Both Walt Thornhill and I disagreed with many components of Velikovsky's reconstruction, but we also felt that Velikovsky had nailed certain principles that can help us to understand the early cultures. In particular, Velikovsky was correct in naming the planet Venus as the great comet. And the cometary language of Venus goes far beyond anything that Velikovsky himself published. In every corner of the world, the language of the comet and the language of Venus are identical. Venus as serpent or dragon. Venus as torch of the sky. Venus as long-haired star. Venus as bearded star. The Sumerian goddess Inanna was identified as Venus. She was the lady of life. But in her terrible aspect, she became a dragon-like flame in the sky. The texts say, like a dragon, you have deposited venom on the land, raining the fanned fire down upon the nation. Inanna became a roaring storm. She devastated the land. Mankind comes before you in fear and trembling at your tempestuous radiance, the texts say. Inanna's Babylonian counterpart, Ishtar, was also identified as Venus. She was the shining torch of heaven and earth. Furious and irresistible onslaught. I rain down like flames, the goddess announces. The Egyptian goddess Sekhmet has the same attributes. She takes the form of the fiery Uraeus serpent. She becomes a flame of fire in her tempest. A star scattering its flame and fire. Sekhmet herself says, the fear of me is in their hearts, and the awe of me is in their hearts. No one at all can approach her, the coffin texts say. The streams behind her are flames of fire. 
The astonishing fact is that goddesses everywhere exhibit this terrifying and cometary aspect. The Canaanite Anat, the Hindu Kali and Durga, the Greek Aphrodite, Athena, Medusa, and countless others. And of course you can add numerous counterparts in the New World, from the Incan goddess Chasca to the Aztec goddess Stroquiquetzal to the legendary Nokomis of North American Indian tribes. The serpent or dragon is an unexplained mythical archetype. There's nothing like it anywhere in the biological world. And yet the same recurring features will be found in cultures the world over. The dragon's disheveled hair and shaggy beard. It's not an aspect, and its worldwide appearance is entwined twins. It's fiery or lightning-like emanations, and it's effusive feathers. In all of the ancient serpent or dragon images, it's the luminous, filamentary, braided, spirally, metamorphosing, and destructive aspects that stand out the very traits of high energy plasma discharge. The attributes of these mythic monsters remain unexplained only until we see the hairy and feathery attributes of the electric arc in the laboratory. We see precisely the same thing in enhanced images of the comet's tail. And we see the same thing in the comet-like discharges of distant nebulas. Gases in a vacuum don't behave this way, but electrified plasma does. Peter Mungo Ju from the Thunderbolts group is talking about instant fossilization of the electric force. The Thunderbolts are so powerful that they could instantly fossilize a mammoth or something else. This is the picture of his video. I'll put it down in the links. And highly recommend it. It's very interesting. But new research is being uncovered all the time with the Thunderbolts group. It won't be long before they'll be able to start their own astrophysical journal. And then they can just ignore the ignorers. It's just sad, really, that everybody has to try to play king of the hill. And they worry more about their livelihood than they do about the truth. I guess we got to keep buying that gasoline. Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. On this series, we have recently presented reports that challenge some of the bedrock beliefs about the history of our planet, our solar system, and the universe as a whole. When it comes to our own world, the fundamental belief system shaping all of modern geology and astronomy is uniformitarianism or the notion that changes in nature happen incrementally over eons of time. It's the position of the Thunderbolts project that evidence from increasingly fine data in numerous specialized fields only confirms the hypothesis of recent catastrophic events on our planet and in the inner solar system. In this episode, Bishop Nicholas Sykes explores the question, is our history far different from that which official science proposes? My previous videos in this series have considered the serious possibility of the science of the modern schools being wrong in areas of cosmology and physics about such diverse topics and phenomena as black holes, the Oort cloud, the composition and genesis of comets, the model of magnetic reconnection, the way the sun and other stars are powered, and Einsteinian relativity, including its restriction of the speed of gravity 
to the supposed maximum possible speed of electromagnetic radiation in vacuo. Science, however, is a broad subject. Indeed, one might adduce from the above, and a far from exhaustive catalogue of contradictions that my colleagues and I are claiming that the whole enterprise of science is flawed in principle. It is necessary to deny that deduction categorically. In my view, what we are claiming is that human intellectual and moral error have, especially during the last 100 years, brought about grave flaws in that intellectual structure that in the second decade of the 21st century is being presented in the schools and in the media as settled science. One basic mistake is to ignore the reality that any science may only be regarded meaningfully as settled and only tentatively at that when its various theories continue to be open to being tested by experiment and observation. Any science theory claiming that further investigation into it is closed has by that claim unsettled itself. If some new observational or experimental discovery is considered to disturb what was formerly regarded as settled, then the true scientific method will seek to find further resources of observation or experimentation to investigate the issue. Too often one perceives those in their settled science castles pulling up the drawbridges as if new observations, experiments and science models must be science's enemies rather than having the possibilities of bringing health and renewal to the great structure of science and science education that our generation is called to bequeath to the future. One of the most long-standing such settled science castles is that model of the Earth's history that may be referred to as Lyellian uniformitarianism. Charles Lyell, 1797 to 1875, who preceded Charles Darwin, 1809 to 1882, and upon whose thought Darwin came to draw. Accepting, one supposes, the Newtonian impression of a solar system that had run like clockwork for all of history, laid down the view that whatever past changes had ever been brought about in nature would have been essentially no different than what was observable in the present. And it seemed obvious that in the present time, natural changes were slow. Lyell's model of natural change in course of time overtook older models of catastrophic change accepted by many researchers and particularly by Georges Cuvier, 1769 to 1832. In more recent times, models of punctuated evolution have been proposed by Stephen Jay Gould and others, but the conditions driving such punctuation are still assumed to have occurred only in periods of time before humans existed. It is therefore by no means altogether surprising that the electric universe model, which envisages catastrophic changes not only before the advent of man, or even only in man's prehistory, but actually within the historical period, has found the drawbridges being drawn up against its advance into the halls of academia. Catastrophe that is long ago and far away is one thing, but the possibility of catastrophe within human history is quite another. Once we accept that, who knows what the geological clock might begin to reveal about our own history, or indeed suggest about the future. Notwithstanding all this, the model of Lyellian uniformitarianism, if we are prepared to be scientific about the matter, should, in the name of science, be subjected to fresh scrutiny. Might not the EU model, which does encompass recent catastrophic change, be a means of renewing the science of our current geological and evolutionary outlook? For the science story of our own day, sticking to a centuries-old uniformitarianism has given us the mantra of no natural catastrophes for billions of years. The Electric Universe account, on the other hand, tells that such catastrophes must have occurred even within the lifespan of humanity. Let us, at the very least, put the two accounts head to head, ponder the matter, and learn. For continuous updates on space news from the Electric Universe, stay tuned to Thunderbolts.info.
I think that's an excellent segment from Bishop Sykes. And I'd just like to add one thing. It is incomprehensible to me that such an awesome power as that of electromagnetism exists in the universe. And cosmologists somehow really think that it's just a benign bystander. It's just, it's beyond me how they could possibly think that. It wouldn't be involved in the motions of the celestial sphere. That's all. It was pretty easy for me to grasp, but I'm not a genius by no means. I just can't understand how they can't see it. They must be blind or that obtuse. One of the two. And now academia is using governmental tactics like compartmentalization. There are all different kinds of astronomers now instead of just an astronomer. One day it's like doctors. It was just MD and DO. And then all of a sudden, one day you got a specialist for everything. They keep them like that so it can be worked on a need-to-know basis. That's not how science should conduct itself. That's just giving them a tiny little tunnel to look down. And they can't look in any other direction because it's someone else's territory. And that's no different than how the CIA operates. To then or the situation for the Earth when it was orbiting proto Saturn, presumably. So we get to proto Saturn's capture. Capture by the Sun <coughs> is almost impossible gravitationally because there is no energy loss. There's no way of losing energy. A body coming in and uh, swinging around the Sun will depart again because there's nothing to put the brakes on and make it go around the Sun. Electrical capture has a huge cross-section by comparison. Two stars will see them each other electrically once their heliospheres or astrospheres, as they're called generically, touch. Now, the Sun's heliosphere is 100 astronomical units in radius. Another star would be something comparable. So you're talking about <coughs> a huge cross-section. So the, uh, the chances of capture of an object is far greater than gravity would suggest. Actually, I'll explain more about this uh, when I give my presentation on cosmology, this change in gravity and so on. So proto-Saturn changed from being a star, that is an anode in interstellar space, to becoming a cathode or cometary body in the Sun's heliosphere. And like all cathodes, surface material is electrically ejected and the body may fragment under internal electrical stress. And this is the kind of thing which uh, the ancients reported. As you may expect in the electrical model, a brown dwarf desert has been identified close to bright main sequence stars because the brown dwarf switches off and becomes a gas giant. And this is what is seen by astronomers. You won't find brown dwarfs orbiting closely to bright stars. So <coughs> gravitational theory only accommodates accretion disks. Expulsion disks are believed impossible despite the copious evidence of stars ejecting matter in jets. Even the sun does it in a modest uh, coronal mass ejection kind of way. It's also interesting to note the large number of close orbiting gas giants about nearby stars. This fits the electrical fissioning argument and not the nebular accretion model. Gas giants have also been discovered at distances from their stars where they couldn't have formed within the age of the star. All of the impossible planets and stars being discovered are not impossible in the electric universe model. Instead, they are expected based on that model. I'll deal with this issue in my presentation on cosmology. So it explains why there are so many hot Jupiters that have been found closely orbiting a star. It explains the expulsion rings and many satellites of the gas giant planets in our solar system. And the fact that Saturns are the most spectacular indicates that it was the last or most recent uh, uh, gas giant to flare up and eject matter. <coughs> right. Axial tilt families. 
A simple method of identifying related objects in the solar system is to look at their axial tilts because in the close relationship between a gas giant or a brown dwarf and its close orbiting satellites, there will generally be phase lock. The satellites all have the same face pointing towards the parent. And as these close orbiting satellites therefore will have their rotation axis aligned with the, the parent. Having the same degree of axial tilt, modified by precession after disturbance, like the tearing apart of the Saturnian system, uh, that tilt to the plane of their orbits uh, of the uh, ecliptic should be roughly the same. And we can ha this is one way of trying to identify members of the same family, because the Sun has an adopted family. So when you look at the uh, planets here, you've got Mars and you've got Venus and you've got Earth and you've got Saturn, the main players. But Venus is the odd one out. Because research shows with great certainty that it was uh, born from proto-Saturn in a massive flare-up resulting from the initial adjustment to the present Sun's quite different electrical environment. And this is why there were all those radiating streamers, because it was born as a comet from an already cometary body. So it, the cometary body fissioned and the, uh, <coughs> the resulting ejected body went into... Uh, it was still captured by its uh, parent. But it too was busily discharging frantically, trying to adjust to its electrical environment. So all of the radiating streamers and the colossal uh, Venus comet appearances can be explained by this model. Now, when Venus was uh, ejecting material, it occurred equatorial. We were sitting underneath this chain of objects and the uh, streamers were coming out radiating from Venus. And this uh, is actually what we see on Venus today. The scars are, are wrapped around the uh, equator. But also, when, you, when these bodies are ejected, the main body may be spinning this way and the material is ejected in a stream, it's given a, a backward kick by its parent. And the result is that the, the satellite initially, <coughs> at least, has a backward rotation. And this is what uh, Venus has, very slow backward rotation. You know, the whole idea here for me is to try to put vital information all together in one place with the links to go to, an expansion on that. And segment coming up here by Walt Thornhill is probably the best it could be said from here. It touches on quite a few subjects. It is our system of distantly orbiting planets that seems the odd one out. In fact, it argues in favour of a galactic traffic accident between the Sun and a sub-brown dwarf like Jupiter or Saturn. End quote. Since I wrote that article, there have been many developments for example, the Kepler and TESS space telescopes have discovered that hot Jupiters are less common than previously thought, and that so-called super-Earths are the most numerous class of exoplanet. The most important developments in electric universe thinking is a more mature understanding of electrogravity, supported by the general electrodynamic theory of the great experimental scientist of the 19th century, Wilhelm Weber, together with the observations of the modern-day Galileo, Dr. Halton Arp. Unlike the Big Bang unbalanced universe, the electric universe is in balance with a dipolar gravitational force which is identical to the magnetic force but manifests weakly due to the gravitational distortion of the electrical structure within the electron and proton inside the atoms of a celestial body. The gravity of that body is established initially by the powerful long-range electromagnetic convection of matter into the center of the Birkelin current filament in a molecular cloud. Being a dipole electric force, the gravity of a star or planet will change with changes to the surface charge of that body. This provides the essential feedback mechanism required for the ready capture of passing bodies and the rapid stabilization of orbits. Halton Arp provided a fundamental benchmark for real cosmology when he found that the universe is not expanding. It is balanced and requires a repulsive gravity to explain his extensive observations. The electric universe had to meet that observational benchmark 
and it does so for the simple reason that all celestial bodies will be spherically polarised with the same gravitational pole facing outwards. They will repel each other. Every ponderable body is subject to that repulsive force of gravity from all of the other matter in the universe, a manifestation of Marx's principle, which results in gravity appearing to be an attractive force. This attribute is essential to understand our survival of the planetary close encounters recorded by our prehistoric mythmakers and memorialized by cultures around the world. It explains why the first civilizations arose suddenly in a thunderclap following those events. The unexpectedly large number of free-floating Jupiter-sized planets in a single nearby star cluster announced in the phys.org report has particular significance for our electric universe cosmology. In the electric universe, these objects are not free-floating planets, but are in fact brown dwarf stars that glow in infrared because they are receiving a low level of electric power from the galactic circuit, sufficient to establish a discharge manifesting as a red anode sheath. Such objects form a reservoir of brown dwarf stellar systems that could encounter and become integrated into a more powerful star system, like that of our Sun. That there are so many of them goes to explain why such an event is not only plausible, but inevitable. Using forensic evidence, stretching back into prehistory, behind in its atmosphere. What I've attempted to show here is a coherent story using forensic evidence, stretching back into prehistory, of celestial events involving planets and their electrical thunderbolt interactions. A new picture of the universe results from paying heed to Alphane's warning to introduce electric universe science into cosmology. This is a fundamental shift from the ad hoc theoretical approach, which has no theory explaining the force of gravity, and so, unsurprisingly, no success trying to introduce order into a chaos of anomalies. It has no chance of ever discovering that we are children of the planet and former brown dwarf star, Saturn. This is an invitation to the greatest adventure, to begin to understand our real history and place in the universe for the first time. And that must bring about a much needed cultural change that may dwarf the scientific revolution. That change is essential if we are to have a future because the post-traumatic stress disorder we have inherited threatens our very existence on this planet. It manifests as a desire not to know the shocking truth because it exposes our existential fears. As Roger Westcott ably expressed it, man is a wounded animal. His survival is astonishing, but his inability to heal his wounds is tragic. It is tragic because, as Velikovsky argued, being descendants of the survivors of great paroxysms of nature of the past, we are possessed by the urge inherited through racial memory to repeat the violent performance. And it was his greatest fear that we now had the destructive capability to produce our own doomsday. Along with that genius Carl Jung, he warned that mankind is his own worst enemy. So the cultural change offered by Electric Universe Cosmology is essential for our survival. By offering a real understanding of the universe and our history, it offers hope and inspiration where presently there is none. There is far more to life in the electric universe than is dreamt of presently. We are all intimately connected with each other and the earth. Enjoy the Saturnian Festival of Lights and the New Year.
Those last three videos by Walt Thornhill really uh, hit home. We really need to have a paradigm change if we want to live longer and live healthy for everything is electric. There isn't any way possible to give you all of the information that is important. So please click the links in the description and watch the full videos for the full impact. Um, some pretty fantastic information. Well, that'll do it for this show, folks. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, donate if you can. Everything's free here. And remember, we have a lot more videos dealing with this subject and the links in the description. If you like content like this, Purple Dawn 3 is in the works and will be out soon. Take care. I'll see you down the road.